Cool, I'll start. Um, so we have been playing around with VMs um, and at Google and Android, a bunch of talks about it. So I decided to play around with it to see how does it react to DVFS or how does DVFS react to workloads running on VMs. Um, it wasn't behaving well, but before I start, my ideal goal here is to, um, if, if somebody chooses to run a use case in host versus VM, they should not have to worry about the performance suffer or the power suffer just because it choose to run it inside a VM outside of the obvious overhead of VM, right? Other than that, it should just kind of magically work. That's kind of what I'm hoping we can get to. And another way to put it is if your host is idle and if you run the workload inside a VM, the CPU performance states you end up at and what thread gets placed in what physical CPU should kind of be mimicked inside the VM. So that's the kind of high level goal on this one. Um, we started running um, this is synthetic benchmarks or synthetic use cases to see what's going on. We use RTF for this. So more, all these slides is going to be top as host, bottom is VM. Generally be two CPUs. One is the little CPU, second one is the big CPU. That's the theme of these slides. Oh, is it? I think it is full screen. Yeah. This one? Oh, sweet. Thank you. Um, yeah, so generally first one is little CPU, second one is big CPU. This is just a thread running continuously. Um, on a host, you know, it reaches the max capacity of the little, it gets migrated over to the big, it eventually ramps up. Um, if we um, run it on a VM, it wasn't moving to the big vCPU at all. Obvious issue here was that we didn't set the capacity, so that was wrong. So if you don't set the capacity explicitly, it's going to think all vCPUs are the same. So load balancing doesn't work right. So we did set the capacity of both the vCPUs correctly now. So we pinned vCPU zero to the little, vCPU one to big, we set the capacity. Um, but now the problem was the v, uh, in the host, things work fine like before. Um, but in the case of the VMs, the threads migrated to the big CPU way too quickly because if you don't have the CPU frequency driver, it assumes you're running at max frequency, right? So we, just to kind of give a comparison, we set the host to max frequency on the little, the big, it can dynamically scale it. And if you see, it took like 41 milliseconds before it migrated to the big CPU on the host. But in the VM case, it took about the same time even though the actual physical CPU was not giving it the same performance. Uh, the VM thinks, oh, I'm running at max frequency. In 34 milliseconds, you reach the capacity of the little and you go to the big. So that's also not good. It's going to unnecessarily move all the little threads into the big CPU. So that is bad for performance. Um, oh, and then despite things getting moved to the big, it's still going to be kind of bad in the VM because um, when you migrate a thread from the host and on the host side from little to big, the utilization is also migrated to the proper uh, run queue of the proper CPU. So you start off at a higher frequency, start off at a higher utilization. But in the VM case, it's always start, the vCPU thread, which is what is dictating the frequency of the physical CPU. That starts off at what well, this is the, I'm using it for the first time. So it starts off at close to zero or whatever you set it to. So it takes much longer to ramp up to the max frequency. So it's like, it's like the worst of both worlds is what you get. Uh, you move little things to the big CPU when you don't need to, but things that do need the big CPU take much longer to get to the performance point. Um, there's also some new thread boost features that we have, I think on 519, um, and that doesn't reflect at all. So one of the features, uh, again, I only partially understand it, or aware of it, but if you start a new thread, you give it some initial utilization that's non-zero, so that when you start off, if you have lots of new threads, you get to Fmax quickly. But all of this is happening inside the vCPU, the host has no idea, so it has zero impact on the performance uh, points chosen by the physical CPUs. That's kind of what I was trying to show here. 
Um, in 26 milliseconds, it reached the max frequency. Even if I count from the first transition, it took at least 79, 77 milliseconds to reach the max frequency of uh, PPU0. Uh, other known issues, a util clamp inside the VM is not um, reflected on the host side. Util S of the guest thread isn't used. That doesn't transfer over either. Another thing is if the big thread migrates from little to big, in the host side, you drop the frequency of the source CPU. In, uh, in the vCPU case, as long as the vCPU is still active, you don't drop the frequency, so it takes time for the frequency to come down when the load has gone down on the CPU. So those are all the synthetic use cases I had, and I had prepared the slides for this uh, LPC, and the Chrome team came and said, hey, hold on, we have actually a real use case you can share. So they are trying to run Android inside Chrome, either as a container or inside a VM. So what you're seeing is here is Android running inside a container on a Chrome OS device. Um, they're running a game. You'll see uh, most of the big threads are here. Not much is going on on the little CPUs. Uh, they were getting about 27 FPS. Um, and frequencies actually do change here, if you can see, are the CPU frequencies. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think either six and seven or four, five, six and seven are big. Six and seven are big, there we go. <laughs> um, and then if you run everything inside the VM, if you an run Android inside a VM, um, you get only 10 FPS. It's like horrible, 60% uh, cut. Um, and you see the thread is spread all over the place. So we're obviously only looking at vCPUs. You can look at the real yes, threads here. But you can see it's kind of all over the place. All the CPUs are active. The CPU frequency is almost hardly changing here. Um, so it's not surprising. You see kind of terrible performance here. That's the kind of all the data I have to show how it's bad. Um, kind of looked into it. This is the current proposal I have. Maybe it's the dumbest idea. Maybe there's a better idea. Good, happy to hear. But before uh, talking about the proposals, some of the other things I considered, and I think this is what I've settled on, is that there's always an option of allowing the vCPU threads to migrate between big and little. At least for this use case, I'm not convinced we want to do that because you still want the ability inside the VM to say, hey, these are going to be background stuff. I want to run them only on little CPUs. They should have a fixed notion of what is going to be a little vCPU. That's one assumption I'm making here. And the other one, um, oh yeah, if you, I don't think you can even change the capacity runtime in a sensible way once you boot a vCPU uh, for a vCPU. Yeah, a lot of assumptions that seem to be made which says early on in boot you set the capacity and it's not changing. So I'm not even really keen on dealing with that part. If we need to, we can. That's kind of my current assumption when I'm making this proposal. It looks like Martin wants to say something. Did I finish my proposal and then, or do you wanna? Okay. Uh, but, um, so yeah, the current proposal is pin the vCPUs to the, so like all little vCPUs will, can migrate between the little physical CPUs, but not too big. That's kind of the pinning I'm hoping we can do. And then all the big vCPUs will stay within the big. Um, and we make sure we set the capacity correctly. So the only real missing piece is um, for the v VM to know what the frequency is of the actual CPU and also as the internal utilization is changing in the VM, you want to kind of send it out of the VM. For that, I'm proposing having a, a pseudo CPU frequency driver for VMs that this will just kind of work across all um, machines, not just for this particular use case, but it will just say, okay, what's the real physical CPU frequencies? Those are the same frequencies I'm gonna claim I can support inside the VM. And then every time you have your frequency switch, you just kind of pass it back out. And you either set the vCPUs util list or util. You know, we have to figure out the math that if you just go update the util, you can end up with some minor errors that can either let it go all the way to max or min. There's some stuff that we need to figure out, but at a minimum you can set util list or even util clamp of the vCPU if you need to. Um, 
And then for figuring out what the frequency of the real CPU is, if you have AMUs, it's already solved. You don't need to do anything. But in the case where you don't have AMU, an equivalent of that um, is to just every scheduler take query the original CPU frequency and update your. Um, so we, we we have a, a question from Srinivas uh, on the on the virtual Srinivas. Do you? And that's pretty much the, all my points. Srinivas, can you hear us? You you have yeah. raised the question question hand. Yes. Yes, I. I'm sorry. Uh, if you're speaking, yeah. I can't hear anything, Shainiwas. I think maybe the audio of the remote is not playing on the. Yeah, computer. so the audio is not working. So, Srinivas, please ask the question on the on the matrix in yeah, the matrix chat, matrix. and we'll repeat it here. I did on matrix. Yeah, I did it on matrix. I think in, in the meantime, my main comment is that you just can keep it closer. Proven that running a running a workload inside a VM just undid all the improvements we've done. In scheduling and power management the last decade because we add this extra indirection that everything is now run inside a vCPU where we have absolutely no knowledge about what's going on in there. Um, I think the most important thing is to decide who actually does the power management. Is that the guest or is it the host? And one thing I don't think you covered is what if you have two guests? Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I was initially thinking about should we just fake a frequency of zero to one, zero to four inside the guest? And every time you have the utilization change by X amount, you send it outside to the host. But then the problem with that option was that uh, if you do have an AMU, the frequency you compute by looking at cycles will not match with the fake frequencies you're uh, reporting inside the guest. No, and the other problem is that inside the guest, you might have time disappearing. Because but I think the because you mentioned counting the actual clock cycles within the guest, as long as that's virtualized correctly, it should be okay. Yeah, but you don't see if if you have something that would take two milliseconds to complete if you were running on the host, not on a virtual uh, virtual machine. You can't tell inside the virtual machine how fast you actually complete there, can you? I mean, you can be preempted. Your vCPU can be preempted in the middle, and it might go off and right, something but if else. I'm not and, mistaken. and that I don't think you can observe from the AMU because the AMU will only count what's what you're doing inside the VM. Right, but I also thought the time doesn't pass inside the VM if it gets context switched out, at least a scheduler time. Yeah, it doesn't, but but real wall clock time will pass. So if you're doing so, it depends on what we're using for the AMU when you're yes. dividing by. So if you're doing like rendering actually, or something like that. Actually, sorry, it goes a good sidebar I had, which I wasn't planning on getting into. But technically, all you need I mean, this is not going to easily apply to what we have today. But this is an idea I had. All you need to figure out a normalized utilization which is normalized for both architecture difference and for frequency changes, is you just need a CPU cycle count. Um, I can go into this, but I want to give Shane was a chance to speak, but I can kind of talk about this too. Okay. How much time do I have, by the way? No. 15 um, minutes? How many time? Oh, let me check. Yeah, I think so. uh, I think I have ten minutes, ten or twelve minutes. Sorry, go on. Yeah, two things. Either you are using a SMP virtual CPU, rely on those to do everything, or you have to replicate in your VM all the information that we've got in the host. So you you're talking about you're trying to answer Morton's yeah. question. Yeah. Okay. And, and I don't think the mic is working well. But... Oh really? Okay, oh, maybe, okay, yeah, better. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, have you looked at the SCMI backend for your VM? It provides you CPU frack information. Um, how to get the CPU frack information? I haven't done that part yet. This is like fairly new um, because oh, it's the, had synthetic data. The, the SCMI is just a, a protocol, and then you can just simulate. Yeah, I'm not too worried about how you get the frequencies, yeah. right? We can get them whatever's the right way, but is the idea okay? Where you fake the original frequencies inside, and then when you set the guest frequency, you pass it out. It still has the issue that Martin was talking about, where you have multiple guests running. It might not be ideal, but I'm sure it's going to improve the performance than what's there today. So yeah. it probably will, but 
we also proven that using containers is way better because then you don't mess up all, all the power management. Right. If, if you were using containers instead, instead uh -huh. then you don't have all these problems. True. I think it's an inherent problem so whether you want using VMs. <laughs> that's one example use case, but there are going to be other use cases for VMs too. So I don't want to stick with that. And even in that case, there, there are other reasons it chose to use the container versus VM. So they're moving towards a VM. Yeah, of course, because it has other right. properties that are attractive. I understand that. But the way we do virtualization is not great for power management can't reason about what's going on inside a VM at all. Yeah. So does this proposal seem like something that that's acceptable as a first, some something we could land as a first step? You can always improve on it if you have other I, thoughts. I think it can work if you if if the guest is is the one that uses your system the most. I mean, you have very little activity outside the guest, but if you do have substantial utilization in your host or in a different VM, then I think you need a lot more coordination so, but, to make things work. So I, I mean, let, let's just split it into pieces. Okay. So let, like the, the, the piece about pinning, about restricting the vCPUs, the big vCPUs to the set of, of big CPUs, it makes sense to me. Like you, because, you know, it's better to live in the same room, right? In a, uh, maybe. And then, oh, sorry, okay, another point on that. Enough. But did you, I, I, I wanted to ask, the, but you are talking about uh, this from the theoretical standpoint, or have you tried it? And then... So I haven't tried this solution. I was, I was going to try this, just hadn't happened. Oh, yeah, it would up. be good to, to check if it helps at all. Like, yeah, obviously, because... if it doesn't help, I'm not going to send it out. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> right? Uh, but based on the data I've seen, I believe it'll help. So. Well, I think fundamentally, as Morton said, you still have the two cooks in the kitchen problem. So you're looking at this from an Android point of view, and then you sort of slide and said, oh, and here's Android running inside Chrome. Do you think really Chrome OS is going to want Android doing the power management on the Chrome system? Probably not. Right. right, it's true, but it's not doing the power management. It's passing the hint over to the host saying, hey, this is some amount of work that's running inside me. Do the power management. So it is not doing the power management. Okay, okay. Right? So what I'm saying is when the CPU frequency inside the guest is set, you pass on the utilization to the host, so the vCPU's utilization can be adjusted to reflect what's inside. But can't the host see the utilization? It knows what idle is and no, what idle it, is not. No, it does, but those are the kind of problems I was kind of trying to show here before where it can't deal with things migrating, for example. That's a simple example. So, but, but these are real physical CPUs, this migration here, right? And no, no. So in this case, what's happening here, let me, oh, sorry. In this case, what's happening, this is VCP0, this is VCP1. So inside the guest, inside the VM, the guest thread has migrated from right. one VCP to another. But if that's what you're seeing here. But if they're pinned, then those really are a physical CPU migration, right? And the host can see that. No, no. The host, all it can see are the two vCPU threads, right? From the host perspective, it's just two threads running all the time. The actual guest, so in a sense, you're limiting what physical CPUs the guest can migrate to if you kind of like translate it into what physical CPUs it's actually running on. But from the host side, it doesn't see any of that. It's completely abstracted. So that's a problem. Yeah. So I'm saying it's, it's completely hidden. We don't want to pass all the information. Let's pass the crucial, crucial information, which is so, really yeah. So basically, the capacity uh, computation in the VM is doesn't, uh, and the hosts are completely independent, right? Uh, I didn't hit the last. The, the, part. the, the, the capacity computation, in the VM and the host are completely independent. So the host has has its own and the VM has its own and they may be off. Yeah. So like, okay. Depending on how much you configure the vCPU, it's off by more versus less. You set the capacity, at least the capacity based calculation is right. You want to go to the chat? No, yeah, I have an idea that crazy is that, uh, no, it's just that. Back to, in speaking to the mic. Yeah, I'm coming back to the SCMI backend. We can have something running in user space as a SCMI backend, which will be shown to your uh, v, to your VM. 
So the VM can say, I want this frequency, I want this utilization. This backend running in user space in your host can then apply some UCLAM value from the C group of your vCPU. So you will be sure that your vCPU will run at the minimum compute capacity that has been requested by your VM. But why do you want to go through user space for that? This will just work in a, this is going to work for all the systems, right? It's, but it, it's not going to work for all the systems yeah. because you've got a very isolated use case of a uh, one VM and one yeah. host. As soon as, like Martin said, as soon as this goes to two VMs or as soon as you want to map a subset of CPUs into one VM and a different subset into another VM, this completely falls apart. Um, but how does that work? I don't, I'm open to other because studies for that. Because the host, that's because the host is still in control. I think we're, we're, you're at the two cooks in the kitchen problem. You, you've got to decide who's, who's going to make the final decision. In, in this case, it's still the host, right? Again, the only thing I'm doing is I'm setting the utilization of the vCPU. If there are two vCPUs that are saying this is my utilization, the host is still going to add them up and set the total frequency to be higher. Is that clear here? Me. But only if there's one guest. No, that can be. Let me. Yeah, but in your proposal, you are you are hacking or you are dating directly the utilization of the vCPU based on the internal utilization of your of your VM. How do you translate this information? Not internal utilization of the guest threads. Yeah. The RQ is util inside the yeah. VCPU. I'm, I'm kind of copy. Think of it as copying it over to the thread that's representing the VCPU. Yeah, but it's not. It's, you're creating a, a direct link between the Linux RQ and your VCPU in the host. Yes. Now, what if you have another in another VM that's a, a Zephyr running? How do you do that? Okay. So the, the only problem that I am aware of with having two. Yeah. Um, with having two VMs is that you don't update the util often enough. That's the only thing. But everything else is correct as for at least my understanding of what my proposal is. So are we on the same page there or are we not? Because if you have two VMs running, they could still calculate the utilization correctly. They'll both set their corresponding vCPU threads utilization correctly. Yes. And if they're both running on the same uh, CPU, you add them up and then you set the frequency. Uh, I would still recommend to, to do that. Uh, yeah, as a, as a you know proof of concept, and then see if it helps at all. Okay. And if it does, then maybe share this information with everyone, and we can see, right? Because if it doesn't, then then it's sure. completely acad academic, right? Yeah. And sure. I think you might be able to come up with something that can work for very specific setup, but. Even so, but, but I want to go to Len's comment of let's not have perfect be the enemy of the good. Right now, it doesn't work for anybody. Even if it works for the case that's only one VM, I'll yeah, be, so, you know, until somebody else can come and say this is shit and replace it, happy, please delete the card. So, right? You know, even even if if it's a, a limited case, then it it is sort of um, if you have the time and are you know. And, and, and resources for doing this research, then th this would be a good thing to know by itself, right? It this this does help really. Yeah. In the, in the, if, uh, but, but you would still have the problem that but, you would have two. Then yeah, but that, the VMs, so but are we on the same happen. page on what when how two VMs will cause an issue? Are we still not in agreement on what the issue is when you're having two VMs? And my the only concern is like one VM might say, hey. Time to, it's time to bump up to the next uh, frequency. So, so the other VM can be a completely different operating system, like Zephyr yeah. or something else. And then, <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other issue. Yeah, but, but, true, true. But even I'm only if, talking about Linux and Cell Linux, true. But even if they're the same, then if you have both EAS or something like that working inside your VM saying, oh, this task needs to go on a big CPU. And I put it on that vCPU, and that's pinned to a specific big CPU on the host. It's not specific vCPU, so within the vCPUs, it can be right, but, but you can still have a scenario where the, v, where the host has already fully utilized your big CPUs, and, and the guest now insists, I want my high priority task to run on a big CPU. 
two, and the host will just say, okay, that VCPU is already uh, going to get but fixed. But what would be the right solution in that situation, though? That the almost right, seems like an overload. The right solution there is not to use VMs because it can't yeah. deal with this. Okay, I'm right. talking about the VM. Okay. <laughs> right. So, so I think that we are we are talking we are really are talking about a limited use case, which is running Android and Chrome in a VM. And in that case, the sort of implied assumption is that the user will not hang themselves uh, uh, right uh, and try to do one thing at a time. And that would be the Android in the VM. <laughs> and that should work. Looks like in principle, more people want right? to talk. John and... So that. I guess two things. One is, it seems like one solution to this might I haven't thought about it a lot, but might be to fully unpin uh, all of the. So we'll unpin, but then dynamically update capacity in the guest. And so, like, essentially, if you could somehow figure out that the host is really busy, and then subtract that from. Okay, some that's of the different from. I know what you. Okay, I know I'm, what you're trying I'm to get at. I'm trying to figure yeah, out. Yeah, you could, Like everyone wants to use. All the guests want to use the so, big. So, right? so, so I, my my point is basically that we we there are problems and we know about it and and we. Don't want to address all of them because they, it's just not possible to you know to address the case. And you can think about nested uh, nested <laughs> VMs then, right? And then continue from there. Yeah. So, but but the the, the, the use case, the, the example you showed is really simple. Just run one VM in one host, and and run the workload in this VM, and that example should should work. And and it doesn't today. Right. And that's a problem. Okay, we, we have exhausted our time slot. So time's up? Yep. Okay, cool. Thank you. So let's have a break, 10 minutes, and then come back. Oh, I was going to ask a quick question, which was, um, it would, maybe would it make sense to have something like a VertIO sched, where you basically just have an abstract CPU, and it doesn't even have to be matching with the host, or, you, or, that, or just two, or whatever. And then basically, every time, go into the scheduler, you call to the host, and then the host decides which of these threads you run on based upon where it's placed the threads. Deciding. I'm not fully sure I understood the last part, but it looks like for every context inside the VM, you want to call into the host, switch all the way back to the host. Update Just let the host end. decide. So basically try to create a transparency from the guest. Yeah, that's the like host. a whole other can of arms. That's not okay. my domain. I think there's a lot of overhead. So we need we need VertIO DVFS, we need VertIO clock, we need VertIO regulator. I mean, we're we're starting to get into pretty. Big Hopefully, you're joking. <laughs> okay, I'll step off. Yeah, the, the, I like the SCMI idea. Actually, that this actually is.